trust is kind of a thread for taking risk because taking risk is really kind of putting yourself into the unknown, feeling it's the right thing to do or knowing that there's going to be a net. And I think that 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 thread of, of trusting yourself and trusting others can be really powerful around the risks that we all endure, risks of running businesses, risks of investing, risks of, but, but it's, it is, it's about earning and developing trust and being able to throw yourself out there. This is the Business OS, a conversation powered by Just Call, dedicated to giving you the tools and knowledge needed to win your business. Business relationships can be tough to navigate at the best of times. Now add family to the mix and the complexity goes up so much more. But our guest today is pretty adept at maneuvering those challenges with a light touch and a sense of humor. And she's been doing it for decades while being a woman in a very male-dominated industry. She began her career as a teenager, working the summers in her father's factory, labeling pails and sweeping the floor. And while you won't see those experiences listed on her LinkedIn profile, she learned valuable lessons about the family business that would serve her really well when she joined the company in 1991 and then took over as its president and CEO 10 years later. Today, she has taken the Vancouver-based family operation into an international organization with offices and distribution in over 50 countries. She also serves as the board director for Export Development Canada and is a strong and uncompromising advocate for sustainability in business. She's also someone I look up to very much and have the good fortune of calling my good friend. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the president and CEO of Crichton International, Carrie Yours. Carrie, so good to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Kushal. I'm very thrilled to be here. So thanks so much for inviting me. Sure thing. And Carrie, really, before we sort of jump into, you know, the details of your prolific career, really, um, tell us a little bit more about Crichton, how it came to be and where it was when you took over. Okay, thanks, Kushal. Uh, our company was started by my father in 1973, Ron Ewers, and he saw a need for building products that would really last the test of time, things that wouldn't just temporarily waterproof concrete, but would grow into the concrete and be a permanent part for dozens, if not hundreds of years. And so with the help of a, a chemist, him and the chemists worked together to uh, build what is now known globally as our crystal technology. And that technology has been used to uh, treat concrete, repair concrete, and eventually to be used as an additive into concrete to make it permanently waterproof, which he did in the, in the later 70s, but took hold in the early 80s. Uh, and so we've really invented the first crystalline waterproofing admixture ever available in the world. Uh, and then when I joined the company in 1991, I saw that, you know, we had projects like the Boeing Aircraft Company and, and other, you know, ma major projects done, but people had no idea about this technology. And so that's really where I kind of cut my teeth on, on spending time with architects and engineers and educating people on concrete technology and how the crystal internal membrane or what's known as Kim admixture, could be added to give long-term durability and replace membranes, which typically uh, are at their best performance when they're first applied and deteriorate till they fail. So I really like the idea of let's build it right, let's build it so that it lasts the test of time. And, and we're working on projects now globally that have design lives of 100, 200, 250 years uh, and, and can help them just Let's do a little bit now and get long-term gain for, for our uh, future uh, generations. Kelly, you clearly gained a lot of deep technical expertise, you know, over the 30 plus years, I believe, of working, um, you know, with Crichton and really leading it. Um, and construction in itself is, of course, extremely male-dominated for the most part, although, you know, we do think, see things changing everywhere. Um, but for instance, there are so many pictures of you online, uh, you know, being the sole woman or maybe, you know, one of very few women in a sea of men wearing hard hats in your signature powder blue sort of power suit, right? Um, how did you navigate that dynamic, especially as a lone woman, really, um, especially in the earlier years, right, when you were still sort of honing into the role? 
One of the great things about being part of ACI is you get to be around other like-minded people who who enjoy uh, uh, learning about concrete. And in doing so, it it helped me build a, even a bigger network of people who who I could learn from. And uh, and I think then you know the fact that you're a woman might be tested at the beginning because uh, it's kind of daunting to enter a a, a a committee meeting where it's all men, but all older men. I mean, I was the youngest there for, I looked around and I'm like, he's actually the youngest by probably 20 years. And I'm the only woman. It's, it's kind of weird, but you know, they, they would test me, uh, and try to not help me. Uh, but I think eventually you, you win some, uh, fans because you, you just stick to, instead of playing the games, you just stick to, uh, doing the work. And if you do the work, and I, I think that's what I've always said to to other young women. Just get in and learn your stuff and do the work. And don't get caught up in the drama. And if you do that, eventually you win uh, people who, who try to, to help you along the way. Yeah, that sounds like a great philosophy to have. Just as, to honestly sort of, you know, be in it for the passion that you have for the job to be done. Um, and really, you know, put your head down and focus on that really. Um, and just going back a little bit, um, Crichton, of course, you know, at some point was, you know, at least started off somewhere as a family owned business, right? Um, did you always know that you were going to join the family business or did it happen along the way? Well, isn't that funny? Because my brother and I were sweeping floors and labeling pails as kids during the summers, right? Because, uh, you know, our parents were going to have us sitting at home doing nothing. We had to come into the plant and and do stuff. And so we always swore we were going to get an education so we could do anything but work in the family business. So our parents never expected us to be in the, the business at all. But then later I was working other jobs and I thought, you know, I could really help Creighton. I could come back and do something because I think the technology is great and I, I think there's more I could do to help. And so I came in and started doing the technical calls for the company, uh, engineering calls, presentations, that type of thing as a technical person. So. Uh, yeah, it's been uh, quite a journey, uh, you know, having the family dynamic, uh, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, in those early years that we could share kind of our different points of view, right? Because I had a different vision than my father. And, uh, you know, I think family businesses have a, a a challenging time reconciling that not all family members want the same thing. So how do you ensure that there's sustainability in the family and 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 that you're pulling or rowing in the same direction, even though you have maybe a different point of view on things. So so that was, I think, some of the earlier, I wouldn't call them challenges, but they were definitely opportunities for me as a, a new leader to uh, to galvanize the uh, the family into, uh, you know, a direction that we all felt was the, the, the right way to go. Yeah, and that really perfectly sort of brings me to my next question, right? which is really around the fact that, you know, you scale up the companies from being um, largely family owned um, and definitely smaller in scale at that time to becoming an international organization over time. And like you said, you know, your brother and other folks, obviously in the company as well, were a part of that journey. Um, what were the biggest challenges that you faced in, you know, that entire growth journey and how did you really overcome them? Because I feel like that would be really valuable for people who are um, running similar businesses and have the ambition um, awfully running their company as well. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when I think about the early days, the early days was just having enough cash to pay the, the bank for the, the, you know, building, to pay the suppliers, to pay payroll, and then hopefully have enough money to pay myself at the end. And actually, I, I, I ended up earning out uh, my shares in the company early in my career because there was months where I, I didn't have enough money to pay everybody. And so I didn't pay myself. But I think that's a real realistic challenge. I mean, you know, if you're not putting something on your credit card, you're you're trying to figure out, well, how do I make, you know, it's in a in tough in uh, business environments, getting enough cash in the door and cash flow. I learned early is king. You know, you can you can make profits and you can make revenues, but if you don't have cash, you you go out of business. And so I think a lot of businesses run out of cash in some of the best years they've ever had. It's not usually the worst years. It's they use up cash faster than they. They got it. They got it available, and and that can really hamper a company. So I think that's over the the years. Those are always the challenges: is managing cash, making sure that you can pay for things, 
Um, I, I also didn't like to take on a lot of debt early in my, I wanted to make the money. So I had the money. So I had the flexibility to do the things that I'd like to do. And so I think I was very conservative, but, uh, I think that's also a, a challenge. I think people feel like, geez, if we don't grow really fast, we're going to be left behind. So that is definitely a challenge. I think for a lot of businesses, how fast is the right rate to grow? How much do you invest? How many people do you bring on all at once? Um, you know, those, those, you know, those are, are definitely challenges. I think every company has to deal with at some point or another. I just talking a little bit more about the family dynamic, right? Um, perhaps take us through the things that you would have had to consider while running a business that a leader of a typical, uh, business would not really be thinking about. Oh, okay. That's, you know, that's a really good uh, question. Uh, I think that one thing that, um, family businesses afford is a long-term view. And I think that's definitely one of the strengths of a, a family business is we can take a, a very long-term view on initiatives or strategies. And unlike, you know, public companies that have to, you know, uh, ensure that the quarterly results are there so that sometimes decisions can be made to happen that are, are serving short-term results, but to the sacrifice of maybe long-term. So what I found was fortunate for me is I could have a longer term view on developing a market. So things like developing the Kim market, that didn't happen overnight. You don't just suddenly walk in and say, hey, we have this innovative ad mixture that if you add it to your concrete, you, it, you can replace the membrane and all your problems go away. You know, it's not a miracle product. You still have to get people to use it properly and use jointing materials properly and place the concrete properly. And then there's that adoption. The, the, you know, uh, the tipping point of where people start to say, hey, this is a viable way. But leading up to that, it's very slow. So, you know, you have to be able to fund your growth uh, with other things during that time. And so so I was able to have a long term view on Kim and its place in the world and in its its place in the building codes and so forth uh, and work uh, literally, you know, decade, decades to to get that commercialization uh whereas i think in 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 many companies if you're not showing revenue and you know double digit profitability growth uh much sooner uh some of those initiatives might be uh put in put into the trash can but uh you know so i feel that i was very fortunate that i had uh an opportunity to do that but also a family that was backing that this is the right play it's just it's going to take some time and investment in time and money. And, and we did that. Uh, even, you know, um, uh, coming to India uh, was, was one of those uh, initiatives. I mean, it was uh, the early 90s when my father, you know, had an eye to, hey, we should be doing more in, you know, in, in Asia, but certainly India. And in 1996, opened Crichton Build Mat in uh, New Delhi and uh, built the factory. And we've been there, uh, you know, ever since. So that's, you know, was that 28 years now um, uh, through thick and thin when a lot of other uh, multinationals pulled out of India during tough times. We never did. We stayed there and we kept working away at it and uh, it's paid off. We have a, a great team in India. We're manufacturing there. I think one of the big projects we just did was the parliament buildings in New Delhi. I mean, these are, it's really nice wins, but it, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it, you know, it took you know, uh, a few de decades to get to a point where, where, you know, you, you have explosive growth and, and people start to realize that there's a better way to build uh, with teams that really want the, the long-term sustainable result. I have to admit that I'm a little bit envious of, you know, ha having the, you know, the space where you could perhaps have, afford to have a more long-term vision and strategy and goals. Um, I think most companies do set out to do that no matter who sets them up and why, but um, in a lot of cases, I think you correct, as you correctly said, right, um, it's difficult to sort of get buy-in for doing things for the much longer term and the longer vision. And you have to be okay with periods of perhaps slow growth or, you know, stagnant growth or any of those things, because you believe that there is, you know, a better future ahead for the business um, overall. So I think there's so much to be said for that. Um, and that makes so much sense overall. Um, you also, of course, talked about Crichton Billmat, which is the company in India, of course. Um, and I see some of this journey, some of it myself as well, right? Um, and that's, you know, for the listeners, that's how Carrie and I know each other, right? Through our families doing business together in India. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful to have seen some of that being built up um, or being run. 
Um, just curious what, um, you know, made you folks consider India in the first place. And I think this would be useful because it would be an interesting lens for other business owners to have around how to scout for the right opportunities. So if you could tell us a little bit more about Crichton very much and India and the journey here, that'd be helpful. It's, uh, I, I think that um, uh, a lot of the international interest and the growth uh, was really uh, part of my father, Ron's vision. Uh, he always saw himself as a, a fellow that would travel the world and, and help grow uh, product technology internationally. And so he gets all the credit for originally saying, hey, I'm going to India. I'm going to find a great partner. And uh, yes, the, uh, the the family has just been uh, wonderful over the decades. So, you know, the, your family's our extended family. Uh, but it's, uh, I think when you're looking uh, abroad, you're looking for opportunity in terms of growth. But I think we really always boils down to getting the right people, like having the right partners. And even initially, uh, when uh, Mr. Kakar and Ron were working together, they brought on a, a very large uh, in, uh, partner to be part of it. And, uh, and that was really didn't work well. And so uh, in the end, we bought out the, uh, the uh, partner shares and Mr. Kakar took over as the managing director. And we never looked back. It was just, you know, working with Mr. Kakar and the family was just wonderful. Uh, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, when you're looking abroad, like we're in, in Middle East and we're in Asia and we're in Europe and we're in Africa. I mean, we're kind of, we would, we'd almost say we're in too many places, but I think when we look at those places, we look at, well, you know, who are, who are the potential partners that have passion for durability that see growth in their, their markets have, uh, you know, a presence there and can help grow. And that's really where we we partner with distribution partners in in market to represent us in in the local area, like like we're right there. And then we have our territory managers and regional managers uh, in market to support them, help with specifications, help them with uh, relationships with with uh, uh, government and developers and owners that that uh, want to build for the future. So these are, are, we're typically in that space of people care about durability or sustainability. They want to reduce their carbon footprint. They, they want to have things last. They, they recognize that if you spend uh, the money wisely at the front end, you'll end up with, with a lot of savings uh, if you retain and manage your buildings or, or track your, your maintenance costs. And and I think that's kind of when we look at the world, we, we look at it as what are the green zones? What are the places that have, you know, economic growth and building that uh, care about, you know, durability or have conditions like in the Middle East? There's there's some very difficult conditions in terms of salt baits and, and corrosion. And, uh, you know, we, we're seeing uh, aggregates that uh, react and expand and create durability problems and and uh, we have recent, you know, five-year testing at the universities to show that we can actually mitigate some of these most detrimental effects that other products just can't even do. So, so I think that's what, when we're looking at the the world crucial. We're we're kind of saying, well, where can we see growth potential where we can work with people? But it always comes down to trying to find the right partners, uh, and that's I think one of the most difficult things that again, almost any company has is who do you uh, uh, partner with? And that's not just, you know, in terms of uh, customers and who you're going to sell uh, with or to, but it's also suppliers. And, and uh, you know, over the years, those were also my early learnings. The suppliers in the, the, the 90s that, that helped me grow weren't just, you know, I, I remember a, a, one of our suppliers back in the day and, and, I was trying to get some bags of, of certain raw material. And, uh, he said, oh, well, you're on COD, so you got to pay cash first before we can give you your, you know, it was like a, two bags or something like that. And I, I was like, okay, I will, but, you know, I'm going to be big one day, and I'm going to, you know, the people who help me are the ones that are going to get the benefit of that. So skip forward, uh, you know, a, a, a few years later, and, and we're now buying that same raw material in truckload quantities. 
And I'm working with uh, a guy named Rick who, who basically said, Carrie, I got your back. I, I'll help you grow. And I, my ask of him was always give me the very, very best pricing. I know my volume, you know, a lot of times it's based on volume. I said, just give me the left-hand call because I don't have time to shop. I'm, you know, I'm trying to generate revenue. I'm trying to get products made. I'm trying to make deals, you know, worldwide. I don't have time to shop for 10 cents a kilo this way or that way. I need the best pricing. And so he, he did that for me. And so when, when this other supplier came back and now that I'm buying truckloads, he says, well, I can give you, you know, I can give you credit. I can give you this. I can give you even a better price than those guys. And I'm like, yeah, you know what? I'm, I'm good. And I think that that's, you know, working with people that you trust, that have your best interests, that work with you, you know, the, the interests have to be aligned and mutual. It can't be, you know, unfair on one side or the other. We have to work together. And I think that's the basis for, you know, making sure that, you know, when you're going internationally, you're, um, you're being picky about who you're partnering with because it's, t it's already challenging you know, to, to, uh, to export and to, to go to new regions. Um, you don't need to layer on more difficulties by having untrustworthy people or people who are, are, are caught, you know, always trying to, you know, do something that is, is not fair or equitable for, for the relationship. So, yeah, I think that's kind of a, a, a little bit of the learnings I had. And of course you don't learn those without having those disasters and, and challenges. Uh, you know, I, I often like to talk about China because we did a, you know, like everybody in the, the 90s, we, we, you had to do a joint venture. You had no choice. You couldn't go in and do your own thing. But, uh, you know, if you read any of the books on uh, what was wrong with a, a joint venture, uh, pretty much everything happened to us. So, uh, uh, you know, but, you know, we're still there. We have our own uh, dedicated uh, office, sales office. Uh, salespeople, uh, we, uh, we've been able to grow our, our business there and, and, uh, we're very proud of, of our journey, even though, you know, I had to learn some tough lessons you know, along the way. Yeah. I think yeah, there's so many powerful threads of wisdom really, right. in what you just shared with us, um, and those are really lessons across people, choosing the right people, building up that trust, um, being in the right place, um, finding the right opportunities and then being brave enough to sort of jump into those. And like you said, this is in the face of, you know, um, regulations around export or any of those factors as well, right? And um, the world was slightly different from what it is perhaps today. Perhaps some of these things are easier to navigate now with the world being more digital and online, but that certainly wasn't the case perhaps a couple of decades ago, um, which is when a lot of this probably, you know, the seeds at least were sown. So I think there's a lot, um, you know, just wisdom. Um, you know, that you've sort of summed up for us. Um, just to follow up on a few things there, right? You, of course, spoke about sustainability and finding um, India or a lot of other geographies, for instance, um, you know, have that focus or that's an important metric for a lot of businesses, right? And sustainability and sustainable living are clearly a passion of yours. I remember reading, you know, somewhere about how recycling, um, you know, is important, is so important to you as well as the person. What can entrepreneurs really do to make sustainability um, a part of their businesses in practice, right? We'd love to hear that. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I think there's, there's so many companies that are doing wonderful things and, 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 you know, I'm still always learning from what other people are doing. And I love to hear, uh, stories about, uh, you know, what companies are, are doing to, to drive a sustainable, uh, uh, mandate, if you will. But, but I think it's just the, the little things. It's like we all share the same planet. And so everything that we can do uh, can help with uh, preserving our planet, planet keeping, you know, biodiversity, trying to, you know, keep the trees to keep the air clean, and, uh, you know, limit, uh, you know, these climate change events, which we're seeing, you know, uh, everywhere in the world, you know, rain happening where it didn't happen before and everything else. But I, I come back down to the little, little things, the, the cultural things you can do around an organization. So um, just having a mindset of w waste and reuse and, uh, you know, recycling in, in um, you know, British Columbia and Vancouver, where I'm at, is, uh, you know, been decades in place. So 
There is never a bottle or a recyclable can or anything that doesn't, you know, it never goes in the garbage can. We have bins, they, we have a very, you know, sophisticated system for sorting out stuff and, and uh, you know, it all gets reused. So very little hits the landfill. But, but even just, you know, uh, single-use coffee cups. This is something, you know, you go to the coffee uh, uh, cafe and they, you get a, you know, a quick coffee with a cup and a plastic lid and, uh, but those aren't recyclable, so they go into the landfill. And so I'm I'm usually uh, advocating around the board uh, table or or meetings that I go to technical meetings and like have your uh, you know reusable cup because then you're not having uh, uh, paper cups hit the landfill and it keeps your coffee uh, pot a lot longer or tea in my case. But uh, uh, you know those are just little things that if. If I think if the leaders are doing it and people see leaders doing it and see that this these little things can make a difference, then it's easier to get to the bigger things, right? I mean, the big things are top. We we kind of rely on governments to do it for us and, and that. But I think that if everybody took uh, a little step to help create sustainability and that's, you know, even just limiting, you know, how many new pieces of clothing do I need to buy? You know, I know clothing uh, can be is, you know, a lot of clothing can get uh, lesser and less expensive with, you know, more advanced manufacturing and other things. But but, you know, can we might be mindful around, uh, you know, use and reuse? Uh, I, I just bought some baby clothes for a friend and I bought them in Montana. And in Montana, we ended up in this little town and they up, uh, uh, what do they call upcycle. Uh, uh, clothing. So they take clothing and then they cut little bits and pieces out and they make, you know, new baby clothes out of, out of uh, uh, old fabrics. And I, and I love that. I, I'm like, yes, I, I'll buy these because, you know, they're, it's, they're soft, they're great, they're, you know, uh, but it's less things that end up in the landfill. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, being uh, cognizant of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, environmental, but it's also sustainability is about making sure people are getting a living wage and that, you know, things are being, you know, we helping everybody live a better life, get what they need, but not waste things, not, not, um, have a, a negative impact on, on our mother earth. So, uh, you know, I'm not fanatical about it, even though I sound like it right now, but I, I think that if we just be, our, we were just pragmatic over, just some of the things we can do. And I'm, I'm by no means perfect. I mean, I still drive a car that has gasoline. Oh, it's not electric yet, but I'm working on it, right? And I think that if we have a mind to what's next, what is the next thing I can do that is just a little more sustainable, then I think that uh, we can share that with our friends and our family and, and challenge people to, you know, do something maybe a little differently. Uh, I think that's uh, powerful in the whole scheme of things. Not everybody's going to build a sustainable uh, complex or building using our Kim admixture to make it durable and, and last a lot longer or our hard, our Crichton hard sem abrasion resistant material that reduces your cement content and saves carbon. I mean, some people are doing that. Actually, a lot of people are doing that in the world that are in the building industry. But for all the people not in the building industry, you can affect sustainability by just simply doing some a few things different than you've been doing them over the past period. I know that focus really on looking at what is um, really in our control when it comes to sustainable living and thinking of, you know, the small things that each of us could really be doing differently. Um, like you mentioned, right, picking up clothes that perhaps could be thrifted or upcycled or, um, you know, just any of those, um, you know, activities could really impact um, in small but then in more sustainable ways over time. Um, on a slightly different note, um, people is clearly something that you care about a lot, Carrie, and it's something you talk about a lot, um, you know, both in our conversation so far, in what I've read online as well, and in what I know of you as well, right? Um, culture and people are clearly important to you. And Crichton itself seems to have a very vibrant culture, especially I think I was looking at the your 30-year anniversary video, and that was clearly a montage of all of, you know, the folks across geographies really sort of wishing you um, so clearly that is an important um, thing at Crichton, right? Um, could you perhaps sort of just explain to us what culture means to you and how do you really um, keep it living? That's a great question, uh, Crucial. I, you know, I, uh, I'm i so grateful that I have uh, so many people that, you know, 
care about me and, and uh, you know, wish me well. Uh, but I, I think that uh, building an environment where people, you know, want to, you know, work hard, want to play hard, uh, that they care and look after one another. I think it, it's, 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 you have to be able to earn, you know, trust and earn, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to, to be able to do more things. And I, I think that comes with every day of being, you know, trying to be a, a good example, trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, ensure that you uh, recognize that people come with all sorts of challenges from, you know, all over the world. Our, we have a very multicultural company. And so we have people from, you know, at one point we had like 25 languages spoken here. And it's and it, it's kind of fun. You know, we get to learn about other people's cultures and where they came from. But I, I think being open to to learning, like we 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 put the uh, uh, the national flag for for everybody's home culture out uh, in our building for a few days. Uh, and we, we tell, uh, we, we share the story about the national holiday and what it meant and the history so that people can appreciate where maybe somebody else uh, uh, came from. Uh, you know, we just celebrated the, uh, the, the Mexican national holiday, um, national day. And uh, so their flag is out there uh, al along with the crate flag and the Canadian flag. But, uh, uh, but I think that it's just that engagement of we care and we care about learning about people. Um, but, it, you know, it doesn't hurt that we took everybody on an all expense paid trip to Puerto Vallarta in April. Uh, that was uh, a reward for making our, our budget and everybody uh, did a great job. And so we took globally, we brought people in from, um, you know, uh, China and overseas and then we all went down to uh, Puerto Vallarta and at a five-star uh, resort, uh, all-inclusive resort, and uh, had a great time uh, with no no uh, meetings, no business. It was just let's go have some fun, and uh, we had one dinner as one big dinner together. But otherwise, everybody could just do whatever they wanted, and uh, I think that helps people, uh, you know, feel appreciated. But also they got to spend time with people they normally might not spend time with. So, you know, because we we're in different departments and, uh, you know, the plant guys are in the plant and the, our, the research and development people are in the R&D center. And so so this allows people to mingle and get to know each other in a more meaningful way. And so, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, but I think it's a balance, you know, the fun things, but also things that, uh, you know, are aligned with people's values in serving the community, uh, you know, helping, uh, helping, uh, you know, the team, um, you know, I think we have one of the best onboarding programs. And so I constantly hear from new staff that it's like the best they've ever seen, but that's because we have staff that are like, take it really seriously. Like they want to have people join a company and really feel like they, they're, they're valued and that we've invested in them so that they're going to be highly successful. And I think that attitude really makes a difference to how people feel in the company, uh, especially when you're new. And I think everybody has that feeling where they've joined a company. And maybe you were just handed a binder and said, good luck. Uh, but I, we really try to make it a, a different experience so that uh, when you're the, you're the most nervous, you're the most vulnerable, you're, you're feeling supported. And uh, our statistics are, if you stay a year at Crichton, you know, we're just celebrating. We have two 20-year uh, anniversaries coming up. And uh, if you stay a year, you'll probably stay a long time. And so we, we really work hard to make sure that first year is a positive one. I love all of that, Carrie. I think especially the line around, um, you know, here's a binder and, you know, go to your job uh, and not doing that, I think, um, really resonates. As someone who leads, you know, on people teams, I think it's so important to make sure that our teams get the right experience. Um, you know, and I think that the teams that really celebrate together and also, you know, get to know each other are also the teams that go on to do tough, difficult things, right? Because that's your average day at work. It's not always easy um, and pretty, you know, sometimes it's messy and challenging. But I think the teams that get a balance of both of those pieces um, are able to, you know, live better and perform uh, much better over time. Um, here's one of my last few questions for you, Gary. What's perhaps been the most difficult um, lesson of your entrepreneurial career so far for you? I mean, there's a lot of tough lessons. <laughs> I think I'm still learning lots of lessons. Uh, what's the most tough? Uh, let me see if I can take a shot at that. 
I, I think I think it's uh, one of the toughest lessons was learning learning that to to learn you had to learn a lot about yourself. Uh, that Im- improving the company was kind of you had to kind of look back at the mirror and say, what am I going to do to to learn more and be better, uh, be a better leader, to be a better listener, uh, to not think everybody looks at the world the way I look at the world. That was a, always a tough lesson, you know, because I I have a point of view and I, I think, well, certainly other people should be able to see that but not realizing that people come with all sorts of different experiences and points of view, and it's all valuable and that you need to really suspend your own judgment and, and try to uh, uh, listen and learn. Uh, and so I think that's, it's, it's the work in progress is always working on yourself because it's easy to get lazy and think, well, you know, I already know this or I know that and, you know, I'm good. But I, I think the hard work is is always being open to feedback and seeking it out, not just, I mean, I'm, I'm the president C, CEO. Nobody's walking up to me in the hall saying, hey, Carrie, you know what? You suck at this <laughs> this week. Uh, you know, uh, doesn't usually happen. Uh, but uh, I think it's it's trying to create environments where you can get feedback and and to be around other peers. So I, I still uh, attend, uh, you know, peer mentoring groups with other uh, leaders, CEOs. And, uh, you know, they know where my barnacles are and they'll push me to, to, to look at things differently. It's uncomfortable. I mean, nobody asks for feedback and says, yeah, bring it on. I love this. I mean, that's really the attitude that you have to have. But inside, uh, it's not easy to hear constructive criticism, right? Nobody likes to hear a performance review where you're not getting A pluses. Uh, but I think it's the most important thing uh, to embrace is, is how do I, how will I know if I don't ask? And then what am I going to do with that information so that it's, people don't just give up to, well, she's a lost cause. So, yeah, I think those are, I think the toughest things is, is, uh, cause you can do anything. You can, you know, build and, and buy new businesses and, and uh, you can be in, uh, I, I'm sure, you know, these days people have careers in totally different industries and all sorts of different things. It's not about just being a subject matter expert anymore. It's about how do you bring value to a company? You know, how do you, how do you uh, work with others to uh, exponentially grow value? And I think that when you do that, you're valuable. And, uh, and so I, my, my job now is to try to not be irrelevant. <laughs> I love that you talked about, um, you know, having that attitude of constantly learning, um, pushing yourself, um, getting coaching, you know, sort of working on becoming a better version of yourself every day. And, you know, funnily enough, it's going to be performance review season for us um, at my company. So I think I will keep those words, um, you know, in mind as I evaluate myself, you know, among other things and, you know, sort of have that learner's mindset on at all times and try and get better. And that sort of brings me to my last question, really. I have a feeling that you probably say, you know, you are, you probably don't have any regrets and you're doing um, everything you ever set out to. But I'm curious, if you had to do it all over again, um, what would you do differently, if anything? Yes, I mean, I don't have any regrets, per se. You're right. Uh, I feel like I'm, I've, over my life and my career, I've done a lot of things and I'm very proud of being um, active at, at doing, having fun, but also getting things done. But I think if there was something that I look back and say, what would I tell my younger self? I think what I would tell my younger self is you can do it faster. You know, don't agonize. I, I think, I don't know if it's a style thing where, or I don't like to go to gender, but I think that, you know, women want to get the things in a pins in a row. I've, I've coached or, or encouraged women to take action faster. And it's, well, I have to do this first. And it's all very lineal and in order. And, you know, I have to make sure I check all the boxes before I move on. And uh, as much as I uh, push uh, for that to not happen when I'm coaching or helping people uh, uh, in both genders these days, uh, you know, I do find when I look back at myself, oh, it's easy for me to coach or or, or preach on these things, is it? Because that was my Achilles heel too. I I don't think I I leverage my my network. I don't. I I was building a network. I was reluctant to ask for help, and I think that um, 
women won't ask for help as much as my male counterparts who were quite happy to go and ask for, for help and support or for, for somebody to do something for them. And I, I think that that's, I, you know, I'm always kind of balancing, is this gender or is this really just style? You know, what, what is, what is this? And, uh, but I, I think that acting quicker, making decisions faster, taking action, willing to fail faster. I think that that is certainly something that in research and development, if you're developing something you want to, you want to, you want to, you want to celebrate the fail. Right. And I think that's, you know, R and D is about, Hey, let's try a whole bunch of things. And, and, and the more fails, the more we, we can identify what's working or what not to try anymore. And I think that business can be like that. If you can, you know, we obviously can't fail to the point where you go broke every uh, few months, but, but I think that, that, that the idea of, you know, some fails of uh, uh, failures are not going to be uh, devastating, but you can learn from them and then build and make new decisions. So it's making decisions. Uh, if they're not great decisions, make a new one. Just just keep making them. And I think that's where organizations can get uh, paralysis by analysis or just take way too long because they're trying to get way too much information. It's like, get enough, get 60% and move forward. Duh. I think that's when I look back over my my career, I think I could have done that even faster. But I mean, we're in a good place. So I mean, that felt really personal for some reason. <laughs> it felt like a lot of I could learn a lot, um, you know, just around those pieces of, you know, asking for help, moving faster, you know, taking more calculated risk. Um, and you're right. I think. There could be potentially a, you know, a gender component, you know, to some of those things. But indeed, you know, you will find uh, human nature across genders, you know, um, to have a lot of variances and a lot of commonalities as well. And I think the points that you mentioned are really key for anyone. And, you know, in the conversations we've been having, you know, over the course of the podcast with a lot of, um, you know, amazing CEOs and founders like yourselves, the topic of, you know, moving fast and, you know, making mistakes comes up a lot, right? Just the importance of doing that and doing that fast. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that's definitely something. And I think it's interesting that the the thread to, um, you know, I mentioned earlier relationships and trust, building trust, earning trust, right? It's not building, it's earning trust. But trust is kind of a thread for taking risk because taking risk is really kind of putting yourself into the unknown. Uh, but, you know, feeling it's the right thing to do or knowing that there's a, you know, there, there's going to be a net. And I think that, that, that thread of, of trusting yourself and trusting others is, is, can be really powerful around the, the, the risks that we all endure risks of running businesses, risks of investing risks of, but, but it's, it is, it's about earning and developing trust and and then being able to throw yourself out there and uh you know i kind of wish i had known all that uh 30 years ago i think it would have been maybe a little easier but who knows maybe it's one thing knowing it's another thing doing but yeah this could probably be a chapter in your book you know what i would tell my 20 year old self right this would probably be one of those chapters in that book that you could you know, tell yourself and from what you were saying it clearly some you know it clearly seems like in a lot of ways running a business is an act of faith, right? In a lot of ways where you have faith in your teams and your people, um, in the experiments that you run and the decisions that you make, right? Otherwise, you're right. You know, you won't be able to make enough progress and the very uh, foundation of business is built on the fact that, you know, you're willing to take a risk and build something from the ground up. So I think those are valuable lessons really for anyone uh, who's listening. And I know that I've really learned an incredible amount um, from this episode. Thank you so much, Carrie, for your time uh, with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Kushal. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon in India. So I uh, can't wait. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Business OS. If you're looking for more resources on how to navigate growth, please go to justcall.io slash the business OS. And don't forget, the journey is easier when you have a business OS.